So uh, again, my name is Wayne Groover. Uh, I'm the chairman and I'm the director of education for Abolish Abortion North Carolina. We are distinctly abolitionist. So in other words, we believe in the clearly defined five tenets of abolitionism because we believe them to be biblical. And who, who knows the five tenets of abolitionism? Okay, I'm gonna give them to you really quickly and I'm gonna focus today on two tenets of, of because I believe the first three is, are, are no brainer. Anybody would, would, would say, oh yeah, that's definitely me. So number one is biblical. Number two is gospel centered. Number three is body driven or obligation of the church. And then four and five are providence and immediatist. And I'm gonna focus heavily on those today, but I'm gonna give you a summary of the others. So biblical, all, all of the tenets or foundational ideas flow from this first tenet. We believe our thoughts, our ideas, our deeds, our words, everything should be fully in submission to scripture. And we oppose ideas and strategies that are opposed to God's word. So we love what he loves, and we hate what he hates. Where does he tell us what he loves and hates? His written, infallible word, his revelation given to us. Apart from revelation, we can't even prove that we're not in the matrix. Nobody can know anything without revelation from an all-knowing creator. And so, and so we believe that everything we do should align with this revelation from God. It's biblical. Second one, gospel-centered. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to those who believe. What is abortion? Well, it's a crime, but it's sin. And so one distinction between an abolitionist and kind of a pro-life, pro-life usually removes gospel things. They try to focus on the science and the philosophy and all these things apart from the gospel. What we say is this is a sin. It's a personal sin. It's an individual sin. It's a collective sin, right? We're all allowing it to happen. It's codified in to law. Well, what's the answer to sin? It's the gospel. I was a junkie. I was a slave to sin. Every part of me enslaved the Lord, the gospel of Jesus Christ, saved me. I am free today. And the Lord is allowing me to even speak his word. I should be roasting. I deserve it. I was a rebel. I hate God's guts. The answer to sin is the gospel, individually or collectively. When uh, there are individual, uh, oh yeah, right here. So um, when someone is considering killing their own child, we know a God who redeems murderers. They don't have to sacrifice their child because Christ already died as a perfect sacrifice, right? When the state spits in God's face and codifies murder into our laws or defines when or how or where children can be murdered and refuse to render justice, what's the answer to that sin? The gospel. Repent and believe on Jesus. Submit to your Lord, legislator so-and-so. This is a sin. You're doing the opposite of what God says. You need the gospel, right? Um, and so, and so, you know, like uh, everyone knows that the gospel, the great commission is to baptize the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. But what else? What's the second part of the greatest commission? Teaching them to obey whatsoever things I have commanded. And so this is a part of the gospel. We are commissioned to do it. I am to bring the gospel into conflict with evil. And that's the second tenet of abolition. Uh, we don't shy away from the gospel. We think it's foundational. And we think that nothing's going to change if we don't repent and put our faith in Christ. Like, uh, third tenet, body driven or obligation of the church. Who is the help me of Christ on the earth? His bride. Who is commissioned to disciple the nations? Us, his church. Who is empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit to do good works in the earth? The church. Who should be informing the civil magistrate when they are doing evil? The church. Abolitionists recognize the folly of trusting in war horses and chariots. chariots and uh, we recognize this, this is a spiritual battle. And we recognize that the assembly of the living God is equipped, empowered, and commanded to do this work. We could care less about big tents. And massive numbers or co belligerents, sales funnels, or crowds. We know that our God will send 15,000 men home and then another 12,000 if they don't drink the way He desires them to drink. Our job is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We don't need a giant tent. All the power rests in His Word. That's where the power is, and the battle is His. This is a spiritual battle. And so, uh, eat, uh, watch this. At the height of chattel slavery, what was the percentage of abolitionists in the culture? 3%. At the height 
of the abolitionist movement of chattel slavery. And, and, and there was also a big war going on then between gradualists and mediatists. But anyways, I'm digressing. So, battle is the Lord's. The Lord defines even how and by whom the battle is fought. And our job is to glorify him, to be found faithful. That's our only job. It's such a light burden. I don't have to control the outcome, right? And so I think most of you would agree with those tenets, I believe. Uh, you might not consider the implications to some of those things because I'm not really going on with them. Uh, but the last two tenets are the ones that I'm going to kind of like really drill in on and I better speed up. So um, providence or providential, we are to rely on God's providence. Duty is ours, results are his. We do God's work in submission to God's word and trust him with the results. So like we can't look at this world or the condition of things or this dragon of abortion and say the foe is too great. I need to devise my own way to defeat this apart from God. It'll never happen. And then the last one is immediatism, which I'm going to go into right now. So we say we are immediatists. And in regards to child sacrifice, what we are opposing as immediatists is what's called incrementalism. Some people call it regulationism. So prior to 2014, I was an incrementalist. Most people are incrementalists. I believe most have adopted this kind of like strategy or this idea that this is a good strategy in ignorance. I believe we've been kind of like hammered with it and like heard it all growing up in church. You know what I mean? So prior to 2014, I also was apathetic. You know, it's like I knew I was like pro-life. It was like my opinion. Okay, I'm like, that's wrong. But I mean, like I didn't live as a Christian should be living in a literal holocaust. You know what I'm saying? So I was totally apathetic and I was also an incrementalist. The Lord woke me up and pulled me out. Um, and so it just makes sense. You know, like it makes sense to me. Less is better, right? Doesn't that make sense? So, so like I understand why people are incrementalism, but I'm going to assault this idea. So don't, you know, like if, if, if you raise your hand, don't worry about it. I was, I was in your same boat. And I'm hoping that if I shine the light of the word of God on this, that, that, that this idea will be eradicated from your mind because I believe literally that it's demonic. I'm going to show you why. So um, if abolitionism is the doctrine of national or state repentance, then immediatism is the underpinning of that call. So if someone kidnaps you, when should they release you? Immediately, right? If my friend is getting drunk and beating his wife, should I tell him to stop right now, fully and immediately? Or is it righteous for me to devise a plan where he only beats her every other week? It doesn't work on an individual basis, does it? Hey, Fred, I can't stomach this. For the sake of your wife, I'm begging you. Beat her on odd days of the week. Wait, why is she crying? I'm helping her. Right? Of course she'd be crying. So that would be a horrible thing for me to do. I'll be, and and that's, that's, that's just on an individual level. I'd be insane. I'd be a monster. So individually, I don't have the authority to suggest, suggest something like that. Hey, break God's commands on this day. What about the church? Does the church have, uh, okay, so what about church government? A pastor. Okay, imagine Fred is cheating on his wife. He's committing adultery. It all comes to light. Pastor Jim pulls Fred and his family into church council. He says, Fred, Martha, show me the evidence. You've been cheating on her for the last year. God commands that we don't commit adultery. It's a great sin, and you're victimizing Martha and the kids. Now, I know how hard it can be to break off adulterous relationships. And I know that you've done this 70% of the time in a hotel. So as the under-shepherd of Christ church... I'm telling you to stop using hotels to do this horrific act. What would you say if a pastor said that? What's the command? The command is don't commit adultery. And an under shepherd of Christ church. So obviously if it doesn't make sense for an individual to do it, the church doesn't have the authority to do this either, does it? Fred, look, it's a start. It's baby steps. But Fred, if you obey me, then Martha we will have reduced Fred victimizing you by 70%. This is a victory, a pro-marriage victory. What's Martha going to say? This ain't no victory. What are you talking about? Two weeks later, Martha tearfully explains to Pastor Jim that apparently there are infinite places that Fred can meet this woman. Pastor Jim scratches his head. And rather than forbidding the act to Fred under threat of excommunication, he begins devising a plan to reduce the days that Fred can cheat. Well, the place, the days, oh, we'll trim off all the branches. We'll work all around the act itself, right? 
Sure, this is a made-up scenario and it sounds ludicrous because if a pastor ever counseled in this way, he would prove that he is a hireling and that he does not meet the qualifications to pastor. Hopefully the church body would get together and remove him. Though these days, I wouldn't be surprised if I heard a story like this. These days. But seriously, imagine if a pastor counseled someone to disobey God and to not repent fully and immediately. Unqualified. If God commands you shall not commit adultery, am I even allowed to float any other idea to someone else? Am I even allowed to entertain this thought? Can you name one created being, a king, a president, the pope, a senator, who is allowed to even say anything else? You shall not commit adultery unless it's the third Thursday? Of course not. It's wicked. We're created beings. We have a creator who has made decrees. So I think I think I've showed you that a, that a, a, an individual and a family government doesn't have the authority to change God's decree. The church government does not have the authority to change uh, to change God's decree. What what government is left here? Civil. Does the civil government have the authority, the right to change or lessen or pervert in some way God's decree? I just want you to think about something real quick though. Authority. Jesus said, what? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority is Christ. So guess what earthly authority is? It's delegated, right? So if I hire a babysitter to watch my kids, I delegate limited authority to perform this duty. She comes into my house. She smokes crack. She calls in boys. She, she beats my kids. She, she shows them terrible movies. Does she have the authority to do this? No, of course not, right? And my kids would say, you're not allowed to do this in my dad's house, right? And they, they, and they would write, even though they're governed by her in, you know, with, with this delegated authority, they would have the right and duty to say, this is my dad's house. And so like when we're talking about obligation of the church, that's what we as the church are supposed to be doing to these babysitters who are smoking crack and letting kids be uh, uh, like murdered and, and molesting all sorts of other things. This is our dad's house. This is our dad's planet. This is our dad's state. This is the Lord God Almighty's authority that you're perverting. But anyways, uh, so I just, I, just, I just want to talk about authority for a second. But civil authority is the most limited government according to our creator. Their authority is limited to primarily wielding the sword. They, they wield the sword of justice. So abortion is sin and abortion is a crime, right? Because there's a victim. So with that being said, let's think about some of our abortion laws. You shall not murder unless you hear a script read by the assassin and wait 72 hours. That's a real law. You shall not murder unless the victim is aged 12 weeks or under in the womb. Right? What about this one? What about the Down syndrome bill? Remember that? You guys heard about that last year? It was like Down syndrome and gender and all that stuff. You shall not murder if you think your baby has Down syndrome. Murder your baby because you prefer sleeping in like a normal person. You know what I'm saying? I mean, implicitly, that's what it's saying. It's a law that forbids the act of saying, I think my baby has Down syndrome. So you just say, oh, it's Tuesday. I'm going to kill my baby today. It's crazy. This is, this is absolutely crazy. It's a sham. If a, what, what, a legislator is God's deacon. That's what Romans 13 says. And guess what? They're serving God as God's deacon, whether they're an atheist or a Buddhist. or They're either a judgment or a blessing upon us. But no matter what, a civil authority is God's deacon on this earth. Okay? So if a legislator or any God's civil deacons can't get baby murder right, just like that pastor, they are unqualified to bear the sword. That's the most simplest thing there is. Should we kill our own kids? It doesn't get any simpler. And someone whose primary job is justice, if they can't figure out the justice of murdering children, they are unqualified. Just like Pastor Jim will be unqualified for explaining to someone when to cheat. What a devil. It's satanic. Because guess what? If they do, they are for sure bearing the sword in vain. And they're wielding this sword implicitly on our weakest and most vulnerable unqualified, unfit, and I believe the church government is, should be more powerful 
than the civil government. So if a legislator claims Christ out of one side of his mouth and he's defining how to kill kids out of his other, if he continues and doesn't repent, he should be under church discipline. Just like if a legislator like cheats on his wife, like a church will make a public statement if that guy doesn't repent. We should be looking at child murder. I mean, you don't come back from murder. You can come back from adultery. So anyways, uh, next, next point. The concept of incremental legislation is, I believe, demonic. I believe it's inspired by the great deceiver himself, and I'll prove it. Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of that tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. We're not going to get into that. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So what's going on here? God, God made this command and he attached a sanction to it, right? Along comes the tempter and what does he say? You won't die, so the sanction doesn't apply to you. And your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God. So right now you're not, you're not as much like God. If you break God's command, you'll become more like God. Think about that. You won't die for breaking God's commands. Okay? Every single one of us are born dead in sin. And if Christ doesn't call you from the dead, if you aren't born again, you're going to die dead in your sin. Right? So that's a lie. It's, it's, it's obvious the sanction definitely applied. We're all dead, dead in sin to this very day until Christ makes us come alive. But what about the sanction part? I, uh, I'm sorry. What about the becoming more like God part? You will become more like God for breaking God's command. So if you disobey God, you will become like God. Doesn't that sound strangely familiar to you? Why, why are we even writing these restrictions into our laws? So there is less murder, right? We're advocating for some sin so that there'll be less sin. We're, ad we're advocating to codify some crime into law so that there'll be less crime. We're advocating that some may be murdered so that less will be murdered. So North Carolina legislators are breaking the command so that we become more righteous. For us to become more like God, to be closer in righteousness to God. Uh, this is the promise of Satan. Break the command, you'll become like God. Does anybody disagree with that? Does that not sound like the original deceit? And uh, Satan also said they'd escape the sanction for breaking the command. He said, you shall not surely die. Has everyone heard of the doctrine of blood guilt or the doctrine of blood guiltiness? You've heard of that doctrine? Okay. Well, uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll read this from Numbers 35, 33. You shall not pollute the land in which you live for blood pollutes the land. And no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. So this is a this is a real sanction. There's a doctrine. It, it could be preached on for probably an hour or two. And you can you can look up doctrine of blood guilt. Read Rusty Thomas. I think he does a pretty good job on it. Rusty Thomas. Look it up on YouTube. So. Essentially, there's a special, deeper, collective sanction tied to the shedding of innocent blood when justice is not rendered. City elders in Israel had to do a whole ritual. So, like, it feels like this unsolved murder. They had to do this whole ritual, um, like, to atone for it because they couldn't shed the blood of the person who shed the blood. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, I think about um, Cain and Abel, you know, like the blood of one man crying out to God. So... Um, this, this is like DEFCON 1 stuff. Legalized murder is the number one cause of death in our state. So uh, the shedding of innocent blood where justice has not been rendered is the number one cause of death in our state and in our nation. So we, we must repent. There's a, there's a, there's a sanction um, applied to this by codifying bloodshed into our laws. We all, we all see the nation unraveling in judgment. We see the perverts prancing down Main Street, adultery and fornication. Um, men acting like women, uh, vice versa. Think about this. You can't even believe a word you hear. I, I watch the news. I talk to my next door neighbor. I see a politician. I don't trust anybody. Everybody's a bunch of liars. There's like a deceit upon the land. Our currency is monopoly money. We crap on, the, on God's concept of private property. We're mixed socialists. We're giving more and more and more power to this pagan deity of a government that wants to be our protector and provider, our healer, like some god. I mean, I think that if we look around, we see we're, we're not getting away with this. The sanction is upon us. 
We've been believing this lie. Our land is polluted. Our land is polluted. And we're, we're already experiencing this sanction for this blood guiltiness. Satan told Eve they would escape God's sanction. Friends, we're not getting away with this. Our only hope for atonement is repentance, the atonement of Christ Jesus. And we must cease regulating how to kill people. This is murder. Justice must be rendered. We owe it to God. We owe it to the victims. But then lastly, um, on, 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 this, on this immediatism, I, I had a legislator say to me, well, if we aren't abolishing abortion, we should be doing something. I don't want blood on my hands for doing nothing. I will run all the plays, and I will support any play that restricts this bloodshed. I get, I get like uh, the idea, but first of all, I'm not advocating doing nothing. But let me ask you this. If running all the plays is valid, how about we introduce a law that says we chemically neuter all males? You'd end abortion. You'd end it real quick. That'd be super effective. You'd, you'd end all pregnancies. That'd be very effective. We should add that to our list of plays. Right, Representative? But of course, no one is ever going to run that bill. And why not? Because everyone understands when it's their body parts on the line that we're not allowed to codify victimizing someone else into law, no matter how noble our intent. So obviously there is some standard by which our plays must be weighed. And my friends, that standard is God's word, God's law. It would be, if it would be evil and unjust to write a law castrating men in order to save babies, then it is certainly evil and, and unjust to allow for the murder of some babies in order to save other babies from being murdered. Everyone agree with that? Has anyone seen the Hunger Games? Heck, even Hollywood can figure out, you ain't supposed to give, that was just two people per district. Hollywood can figure this out. We're giving up 31,000 per year. If you've seen the Hunger Games, they're giving up two people from each district. Why? To prevent further bloodshed, to prevent a great, you know, civil war and all these things. Even Hollywood knows. You ain't supposed to do that. You don't give up some people. You don't victimize some people to save other people. It's wicked. It's a deceit. Stop believing this, friend. So no, running, running all the plays is not a valid concept because we are obligated to submit how we fight this war to God. You, like in a war, you can't bomb hospitals, gas civilians, even if it saves a whole bunch of people. That, that makes you a monster, right? If we have to become like Satan in order to defeat the works of Satan, then what's the point? We're going to end up in the same pit with him. What's the point? The work that must be done is a work of God through the Spirit, and our work is an unwavering proclamation of and standing on the Word of God. We're not going to trick or cunning or 4D our chest, 4D chess our way out of this. Our people murder their own children. We need repentance. You don't get repentance toward Christ by giving up the word of God. You can't defeat child sacrifice with child sacrifice. I've had lots of people, even legislators, say, say to me they support incremental legislation. If, uh, 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 watch this. If a house is burning down and I know I can rush in and save some, it would be evil of me to not save any if I can't save them all. Have you ever heard that metaphor? You know, so like, you know, so I say, no, no, no. We can't put forward this legislation because it codifies murder in law. We must put forth this legislation. Hey, look, I'm doing all we can. If the house is burning down, it would be wrong of me not to rush in and save some. I can save some. I've had a legislator tell me this before. Lots of people tell me this. Well, of course. If a house is burning down, I should rush in and I should save as many lives as possible. So should my other neighbors. So should the local fire brigade. Right? But here's the deal. When a civil magistrate says this, the civil magistrate is to wield the sword. Their job is to put the sword to the neck of the arsonist that burnt down my neighbor's house and killed his kids. That's their job. I can't hold a trial for the arsonist in my backyard. That's out of my ordained allowability. See what I'm saying? I can't do that with the church government. I can't do that with my family, right? That's, the civil magistrate must wield the sword on the arsonist. And so in the same way, it's crazy 
for a civil magistrate to say, I should write laws that codify some people into play because if I don't, I'm not saving anyone. No, sir. That's not how it works. Your, your literal only job as a civil magistrate is to punish the murderer, to, to render the justice, right? And something that, that I don't like about this like metaphor or whatever is that people dump off their job onto the magistrate. No, we go out and preach Jesus. We go interpose. We go help young couples, right? We hide Jews in our walls. We help slaves escape through the Underground Railroad while we're seeking its abolition, right? That's our job, you know? So like whenever we go, hey, why aren't you saving as many lives as possible? Run, run, run this play. Well, you just want to sit on your butt and vote and pray about it. Because I guarantee you, like, we're at meals all the time and people are little, little, like little Christians in tears. Usually one or two people out there. So all these churches everywhere, it's a sham. All these churches, you go to an abortion clinic on a Tuesday, there'll be one guy out there. Makes you want to cry. A stream of people, 30 people killing their own kids. Everybody knows it's happening. Everybody wants to sit back and vote and act like it's the dang legislator's job. We help people escape. We run the Underground Railroad. They wield the sword. Let's get in our lanes. You know, like, I really want to provoke you. Like, <laughs> we must not ignore this anymore. Like, have you seen the numbers? There's never been anything like this in all of human history. You were born at this time in redemptive history. You think Christ doesn't know what age you live in? He raised you from the dead. I was a jokey. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're here. You're not. The, the apostles, like, all these guys you read stories about, all these heroes, they're not here. You are. So please, you rush into the burning building. Please. So that's the fourth tenet, immediatism. Hopefully, I persuaded you to ditch the incrementalist strategy utilized by the pro-life movement at large. I pray you adopt immediatism. Immediatism is the unrelenting, unwavering call for full and immediate justice. Anything short of what God commands, if, if anything short is offered, we call it sin. I oppose it. I don't care if it's the 99.9%. .9%. If there's a .01 poison pill in there, I'm against it. Because if it ain't what God says, we don't want it. We know the weapons of our war are not carnal, so we don't step off God's word, no matter what the deceiver promises. God says what? You shall not murder. We cannot exchange that for anything else. We can't, we can't exchange this for worldly risen, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't refuse to um, disobey him that we might obey him. This is also one of the big reasons why I've totally ditched the pro-life term. You know, like, I thought it was really cool what you said earlier, about, about uh, oh yeah, I'm a conservative. Well, a conservative today means way different than 20 years ago. It's a sliding scale. And it's the same, and it's similar with the pro-life moniker. It means a lot of different things. There's like Wiccan pro-lifers, atheist pro-lifers, secular pro-lifers, feminist pro-life. There's like all these different things. It means all these different things to different people. Abolitionism has clearly defined tenets. So I think it's much more expedient. I think it's really important to drive this distinction home. The whole pro-life movement started literally on the concept of incrementalism. That's, 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 that's kind of like what kicked off the whole thing, or at least the legislative area. So like a lot of the movers and shakers are involved in the legislative arena. And just recently when a bill of abolition for the first time ever was gonna hit the floor in Louisiana, 76 pro-life organizations got together and they signed this letter. I can give you the link to it if you don't believe me. 76 large pro-life uh, that said, you should not um, punish women. So like, Imagine if, if we're, you know, like in the days of chattel slavery, you shouldn't punish plantation owners. I mean, like, just doesn't make sense. I mean, and, like, how, like, how degrading to women, as if they don't have a God-given conscience. A four-year-old little girl looks at her mama's belly and goes, mama's got a baby in there. Of course, of course everybody knows that's a baby. How degrading to women to even say, oh, we shouldn't. You know, like like they shouldn't answer for for their crimes. That's that, to me. That's 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 degrading. But anyways, um, last last and final tenet uh, is providence. I spent most of my time on incrementalism uh, because I wanted to expose that and, and and show you that biblical immediatism is the way. So I want to make this short. Number one, God's sovereignty is His right, His power, and His authority to do all that He decides to do. God decides. God decrees. 
No one can ever stop it. The buck stops with God. He is sovereign. If God speaks something and every single one of us disagree with it, it doesn't lose power or authority because God says it. What we are is rebels. That doesn't mean that his authority is lessened. Doesn't mean, it doesn't, it just doesn't mean that there's no power in what he said. What it means is we're rebels. Um, God's providence includes his sovereignty, but is the process or outworking of him seeing to it. It's not him simply passively seeing it, but seeing to it, supplying it, providing it, pro vide, seeing to it. That's God's providence. So like consider Christ. He was a perfect sacrifice from before the foundations of the world. He was sacrificed as a perfect lamb for those who put their faith in him and his work. This providentially played out by John the Baptist forerunner, a virgin, an unplanned pregnancy, being injected into redemptive history at a time when crucifixions were normative. See? So God decreed Christ before the foundations of the world, and then God saw to it. He made it happen. That's God's providence. And everyone here is probably saying, why are you even saying this? We're Christians. Of course we believe this, but that's the issue. Because many, many, many affirm it, but many, many less believe it. And in regards to abortion, I can show you some examples of some blatant examples of the denial of God's providence. I'm sure a lot of you have spoken with legislators, you've lobbied for various things, spoken to legislators, right? So, um, in fact, uh, their denial of God's providence is ultimately why they choose to put their faith in legislative strategies like incrementalism that are in opposition to what God says because they're faithless in this area. So, therefore, they become pragmatists who choose worldly wisdom over godly wisdom because they believe it to, more, uh, to be more expedient. They imply, whoa, this, this is too big. This is too impossible. God will not see to it. His way won't work. I will see to it my way based upon my wisdom. And this is what it sounds like. Uh, these, are, these are literal quotes from Pastor Philip Shepherd, who is my house rep, pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church in Jacksonville, North Carolina, Representative Phil Shepherd, and um, Representative Kidwell. These are, these are actual um, quotes. I can't put forward this bill of abolition. The Democrats will overturn it. It's too extreme. We will lose seats to the Democrats. A woman needs to put forward this legislation. I can't because I am a man. Tim Moore is opposed. He will never let it happen. There is absolutely no way this is going to happen. I'm not going to put this forward because there aren't enough strong Republicans to back it. So it's pointless. It's pointless if we have no hope of winning. My friends, this is what faithlessness looks like. This is what a denial of God's providence sounds like. This is an ugly smear on the face of Christ Jesus. Our risen Lord, the creator of the universe, sovereignly decreed you shall not murder. What in the world? gives them the right or the authority to say anything else. Are they sovereign now, more sovereign than the Lord God Almighty? They, every single Republican, every single Republican just supported and backed a 12-week ban that spits in the face of God, but they won't put forward legislation that is pleasing to God. They conspired to disobey God with a 12-week ban for a month. One man could have opposed that 12-week ban and stood for the Lord. I don't know what would have happened. I don't know what the result would have been, but I know that God would have been glorified. And in the state house that day, the voice of God and the call to repent toward Jesus would have been heard by everyone. Phil Shepard, pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church, God's servant and civil deacon. I've told you this before, but I'm going to say it again in front of all these people, in front of God and everybody. If you refuse to do what your Lord says, because Democrats will take Republican seats, you fear Democrats more than the almighty, all-sovereign, all-powerful, and living God. You won't even affirm your God-ordained role as a man. You want to outsource this battle to a woman. You are supposed to protect women and children, not shove them out front to take arrows for you. In the, set, in the sight of God, you publicly smear, smear the face of Christ. And the last thing I want to do is, besides ex, like practically showing you what a denial of providence looks like, looks like and publicly rebuking Phil Shepard. The last thing I want to do is I want to encourage any man in this room 
that's seeking to be God's servant in the civil realm. I want to please encourage you after many, like talking with so many legislators, please put your faith in God, obey God. He is worthy. Walk by faith. Don't walk by sight. In spite of what you think might happen, in spite of what may very well happen, in spite of what you may lose, in spite of what you do lose, trust the Lord, stand with the Lord, even if you believe you're all alone, you do the work, you obey God, leave the results to Him. This is providence. And to everyone else, when the very rare man, the very rare man, stands up and does what God says, we must rally around him. We had a bill, HB 158, it was a shame. It was a shame how the church reacted. It wasn't Rick. It was a shame. I was so I was so tore up about it. Like I thought for sure the church was gonna come running. Abolition. You know, like it was it was righteous. Um, and so and so for everyone else, man, uh, when 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 a legislator actually does stand on the word of God, don't let him be shredded by himself. Please support him. I want to leave you with this verse. I have said these things that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Thank you.